I'm really pleased to be with you here today to talk with you about technology and the transformation of work as part of your future of work uh, meeting and, and discussion. Uh, it's great, great to be here. Uh, my name is John Mitchell. I'm a professor of computer science here at Stanford University, where I've been for a little over 30 years. Worked on programming languages, software correctness, computer security. And in the last 10 years or so, I, I've had a bit of work on education, technology, uh, predicting the future a little bit. I was vice provost of the university around digital learning for about uh, six years uh, in the last decade. I'm now chair of the Stanford Computer Science Department. So great, great to talk with you. I'd like to say, speak a little bit about the future of work, your topic for today. Uh, in my mind, and, and, and for many reasons, I think that connects with the future of education. Uh, if the work is going to evolve, people's career paths and uh, needs of employers are going to change, then, well, we need some way to help people track that and be successful in their lives in the future. And that's generally boils down to education. How do we train people or give them the knowledge that they need and the opportunity to move forward and, and be successful? And in and this transition we're, we're in, and because and it's going to continue around uh, presence of digital technology, artificial intelligence, automation. You know, we have questions to ask about the future of society. What sort of world do we want to live in? Are there policy issues, economic considerations, regulation, other things that would affect the future of work and the future of society and how that all, all works for everybody? So I, I put think of these three things as, as overlapping. Uh, I'll speak mostly about the top two, and, and you can think a little bit about the implications for, uh, for your future and the society you want. I thought I'd give uh, refer to three books here as a way of uh, centering the discussion, but also to give you references and, and uh, things you could, you or others you work with might want to take a look at to get oriented to some of the issues. First book on the left is one that's well known. It's called The Second Machine Age. It really follows up on the idea that in the Industrial Revolution, or the first Industrial Revolution, let's say, uh, we had steam engines, we had automation that did physical work for us. So we could replace horses by steam engines, you know, build manufacturing plants, uh, cars, things that really change the way that we move around and do physical things in the world. In the second machine age, we have automation and machines that think for us, that do cognitive processes, help us with reasoning, help us recall data, you know, make predictions, uh, and who knows in the future, in some sense, provide better judgment. Actually, we do have research here around uh, ways of trying to help judges and people involved in the legal system make more systematic and fairer decisions. That all comes about with, with automation. So I think that's background, and I think many of you here are familiar with the, the trends and ideas there. Second book is just kind of a reference on uh, the state of the world, the economy, social change, and uh, changes in the future of work. You know, Now, the book is a little bit pre-pandemic. I think the forces there are, are still uh, at play there. The third book I'll come back to later in the talk. It's a, it's written by the president of Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. It's about education moving forward and how to help uh, our students and uh, at their college age, but also through their whole lives, be prepared for future work uh, to be successful to track the development of technology and, and be participants in that. So I hope th those three books as as a uh, grounding, you know, help, help you and uh, inform the discussion to say a little bit more about the McKinsey work. And you can find some breakdowns and charts, you know, associated with that book that might be helpful. Uh, you, you may have that information and many here in the, in the discussion may be expert in this. You know, talks about the global economy, the rise of the developing world, urbanization, uh, globalization. A second point has to do with <clears throat> digitization, the rise of digital technology, uh, <clears throat> automation, continued technology advancement. Third is, is because it's a U.S. book, it, it, it relates to the U.S. income inequality. The factors there affect different economies in different ways, but it talks about the way that uh, I think we can see that digital transformation affects 
uh, different people with different kinds of work differently and, and creates uh, different economic uh, inequality than you might have without that. And then the, the, the point that's this relevant to our discussion today is about the future of work, automation, labor market platforms, different ways for people, for employers and workers to find each other, independent work. So not just what work is getting done and how is it done, but how do how is work organized, how do organizations change, uh, and so on. As a computer scientist, I want to kind of give you some uh, ways to think about technology that I, that I hope will be useful to you uh, in various ways. So for most of the time that I've been a computer scientist, most of the field has been concerned with uh, the picture on the left half of the slide, this stack of different kinds of technologies and the way they relate to produce modern computer systems. We've historically been concerned with how to build a computer network, how to do efficient storage, how to scale storage. Virtual machine and operating systems are kind of the software infrastructure that helps modern applications run. And then a modern application might have data, might have some common features that are used across many applications called middleware, and then some application. That means the thing that a person interacts with in order to use the computer. For most of the, of, of the last you know, 50, 70 years, the field has been concerned with making those things work better, scaling them, making them cheaper, bigger, and so on. Uh, I think all the action in the recent decade and going forward, a good portion of it is really around how do computers, digital technology relate to the world. So that's the future of our field. And so when people go into to digital technology, computer science, really they're studying both how computers work, but also how do they interact with social systems, economic systems, communication, political systems. That's really where, where the future is. Uh, and I think that's important for anyone, you know, kind of saying, what do people have to know about technology? The world is not driven uh, solely by technology, but the technology's interaction with, uh, with other factors. Because artificial intelligence and <clears throat> automation, excuse me, are, are such an important part of our discussion and, and your thinking today, I want to give a little brief history of artificial intelligence just to kind of identify what's happening why it's happening now, what we can predict and, and think about in the future in, in a sense too. So this is really very approximate. I've taken a little bit of liberty with the dates and so on, but I think this is this a, a quick way to understand this. In the beginning of artificial intelligence, the one of some of the most early work said, well, humans think logically. You can go back to Socrates and Plato and the Greeks and syllogisms and you know, if, uh, if all men are mortal, Socrates is, is a man, then Socrates is mortal, that kind of reasoning. So early artificial intelligence systems tried to build that in to computers. After building those, people realized, well, it doesn't really help very much to do logical reasoning if you don't know anything. So that led to the development of what were called expert systems. In that phase, researchers uh, and knowledge engineers, as they were called, would go and interview experts. And if you want to make medical diagnosis, you have to spend an awfully long time talking with a medical expert to try to get enough information to do a reasonable diagnosis. So the limiting factor here was capturing knowledge by hand by interviewing experts, but it's possible to do that. And that showed that knowledge plus reasoning are way more powerful than either one by themselves. Fast forward then to the 1990s, there was a resurgent in interest in things like neural networks, different models, probabilistic graphical models, a whole set of things having to do with capturing probability and uncertainty. So just reasoning about man, woman, mortal, you know, uh, immortal, that, that kind of reasoning doesn't get at probability and uncertainty. That's, those are important factors in the world you know, we live in. So incorporating those into the representation of information was a step forward. And then from there, that enabled sophisticated learning algorithms that replaced the process that was slow and cumbersome in knowledge engineering by learning from data learning from data and putting the data into a sophisticated model that's set up to deal with 
probability, uncertainty, uh, gray areas, subtleties, and so on, that's what really brought us to where we are today. So we have some models and some history, but the real breakthrough was applying learning to learn from data instead of coding by hand. This process also uh, coincided with improvements in computers, improvements with the speed and processing power and, and memory. And the things that we do now just wouldn't have been possible uh, you know, 30, 50 uh, more years ago with, with the weaker computing systems. Really, in order to move from the beginning to the end of this chart, needed about 100,000 times increase in computing power. So that's also part of why, why, where we are today. So looking forward from this, one thing to say is this revolution, this breakthrough around learning is kind of still early. So I think anyone familiar with the field will believe that the power of AI will continue to increase. We're really not at the end of some kind of change. We're early in this. And so many, many things can, can get better. To give you a specific example to help you see that things may change very dramatically in the next 10 to 20 years, there's a current bottleneck in applying AI to applications, learning from data, requires someone to say specifically, what kind of factors in the data, what features are we gonna to use to train the learning algorithm? That's difficult, it's sophisticated, it's an iterative process, it takes expertise. And one of the reasons why companies and organizations fight so hard to get uh, some of the few experts in machine learning is because this skill is, is kind of rare. If we can automate that, if we can develop more systematic methods and tools to help many more people develop AI models successfully, then that will open the floodgates and things will change even more dramatically. I expect that's happening. There are a lot of companies, organizations, researchers working on methods to understand a model, improve them, uh, and so on. As we proceed, I also just want to make a note that you know, ethics, public policy, regulation, these things always lag uh, advances in technology. We're getting into environment, you know, situations which I'm, I'm sure many of you appreciate, where uh, there are ethical decisions about how to use uh, AI, how to use AI to select the news. Should it choose what we're doing? Should it, uh, what are the basis for telling what, uh, deciding what someone should see if they if they want to read the news? Self-driving cars will have to make difficult decisions and so on. So I, I think that it's also, as you think about the future of work and the future of society, it's important to also note that uh, as we educate workers who will build AI systems and leverage them and be, you know, fuel the economy, we also want to kind of set the stage for firm ethical decisions, good public policy, regulation when needed, uh, and so on. Here's, a, here's something I, I went to Thailand and talked with some people involved in this, and I think it's just illustrative of what uh, many, many people are thinking about in different parts of the world about digital transformation and what it means. And I, I think this probably relates to some of your thoughts too. Their thoughts involve, it's a ag big agricultural business, transforming farming to smart farming, use more data, use more uh, AI, use more methods to uh, be more effective at, at the main tasks they're doing. Uh, this will change also the nature of businesses. Large established businesses will, will you know, be replaced by startups in many cases because the technology needed to be successful will change. Uh, services will change. Uh, the need for unskilled labor will, will be replaced by uh, a need for uh, more skilled, more knowledgeable uh, labor. And instead of buying technology for everything, everything, it might be advantageous to be able to make technology. And I, I think that's a, a common view. Uh, you know, referring to another source, uh, there's a U.S. National Academy study on information technology automation in the future of work, and they made a couple of different kinds of points. I just want to emphasize two of them. The first one is kind of represented by these three bullets. It says, as I was saying before, that uh, advances will continue. The biggest improvements in AI are probably ahead of us. So it's not like we're done. You can try to take a stock of where, where we are and account for that. You have to be prepared for, for rapid change going forward. Uh, 
there are you know, cautious people who say, well, AI will remove jobs, eliminate work. What will we do? Will we have a, you know, guaranteed uh, minimum income for everyone? How will we deal with that? I think a, a broader view, a more informed view might say uh, some jobs will be eliminated. Some jobs will be more powerful. Those industries, the things people do more effectively will expand. And there'll be new jobs created around uh, using automation. In addition, uh, modern digital technology will enable new work relationships. As people work with information and data and processing, they don't have to be in the same place. Pandemic has really given us a, a jump start, you know, kind of accelerated some things there. I think that's a, a trend that, that we could see before and, and will improve. When we think about educating and the life course for of someone's, uh, you know, career paths, uh, workers will need creativity, adaptability, interpersonal skills to work with each other and, and with smart automation. And policymakers, researchers, others would uh, you know, benefit from knowing more about the technology. And I'm, I'm sure many of you uh, appreciate that. In thinking about education, what do people need? I hear so often somebody saying, well, I'm going to tell my son or daughter to learn to code because that's the future. I think the, the, the picture is a little more nuanced and I wanted to give you this illustration to see if, if that helps. At the bottom of the pyramid are things that are uh, more routine, using digital tools for tasks that a person understands and knows. You know, the technology just helps them be a little more effective at that. And at the top of the pyramid, you know, where we need a few people to keep advancing the science so that we can keep leveraging the potential of technology uh, to build the economy, advance society, give us more choices, give us more control over technology that I think is, is going to be present with us. So you can think about in an education or workforce training environment, <clears throat> think about which of these layers of the pyramid, and you, and you could name them differently, but the, the idea I think is, is robust, you know, which of these layers of the pyramid are appropriate uh, and how would you provide them to workers and individuals and citizens that, that need them? Uh, in different ways. Here's a, here's a concept maybe that helps is, you know, in a project team, solving a problem, building a product, maintaining something, answering questions. You, know, you might have about half the, the agents, the participants in the team would be people, and half might be, you know, replaced by algorithms that, that provide data, provide insight, provide judgment, provide recommendations. I'm gonna, you know, if you think about investing or something like that, I know that there's already that, that world. The idea here is that people in the future will need better skills at reasoning with and, and interacting with sophisticated technology. Here's an example I like. It's, it's you know, from my life history, but, but I hope it will give you a little bit of, a, of an idea. Uh, my daughter, when she was about eight, spent a tremendous amount of time with this game that's a uh, virtual environment. It's called Creatures. It was developed by an AI researcher in the 1990s. Very, very widely used. Uh, one of the most popular things of this time, uh, type of all kinds. It has these little creatures that are hatched from an egg. They land in the world. They don't know anything. You, as the person playing the game, you know, uh, managing this environment, can teach them things. You can type something in, and they'll learn words. They'll learn to talk to each other. If you have two of the creatures that have both learned uh, the language you've taught them, and so on. And my daughter was just fascinated with it. She spent hours and hours and hours at this. And after a while, I said, Laura, what do you think? How does this work? You know, what do you think is going on in there? So I was really curious. And what she said was something that, you know, will always stick with me. So I, you know, I have it here to present you. But she said, every creature in the game has a fate card. So that's a word she made up, fate card. That's a card that determines, you know, a list of things that the creature can do. When you teach the creature a concept, that concept is added to their fate card. And whenever it's time for a creature to move, they choose randomly from actions that are known to them. And they do something that's on their fate card. I thought that was just fascinating because it really, to me, crystallized what she needed to know and understand in order to interact with a sophisticated uh, artificial intelligence virtual environment effectively. It has these fundamental concepts of data, data structure. There's information arranged in a certain way inside this game. There's an algorithm. There's a method for causing it to, to act systematically. There's a control loop. There's an interaction between the program and the environment, the user and the player. 
So it responds to user input. And there's some ideas about data collection, randomization, and probability. Things didn't always go the same every time. Now, her model is pretty straightforward and, and you know, good for an eight-year-old and good for an 80-year-old working with certain kinds of artificial intelligence. Not totally accurate. The game was actually far more sophisticated. Uh, creatures were made up of large number of neural nets, a modern uh, AI model. Uh, but you know, her model was accurate enough for her. And I think that's what most people need in most circumstances is a predictable way of thinking about what the artificial agent will do in order to interact with it systematically. Now I want to refer to the third book that I mentioned. Uh, this is a book uh, around future of education, and I think it gives you a framework. There, there, are, there are other ways you could think about things, but this, this is a starting point. So uh, Joseph Aoun, the author and president of Northeastern, says, well, we need three things. We need to change the curriculum. People need to understand technology. They need to, need to understand data and be data literate. They need to understand the world that this automation interacts with. Uh, there are better ways to learn than sitting in the classroom and receiving stuff that people tell you. Go out and experience things and try by yourself. That also sets people up for lifelong learning if they understand how to find new information about something that challenges them during their day. And, and then there's also some points about lifelong learning. So I think it's a nice framework for thinking about the future of education or the way that a government or a society can help people be successful as we enter a rapidly changing environment around the future of work. So I hope that's helpful to you. Some principles here are digital fluency, things at various layers of the pyramid I showed, effective use of software, tools, and platforms, and understanding about data science and the influence of data on machine learning. When we use machine learning, we write or create a computer algorithm and the way it behaves based on data instead of writing code. So I think this data science and the way data influences uh, behavior of a system is just as important as, as learning to code. <clears throat> And you know, very prominent going going forward. It's also important to give a, uh, appropriate attention to ethics and the impacts on society. There's a lot of research and work on bias in in AI algorithms, fairness, how to improve the fairness of something, and and those methods I think will also improve along with the kinds of methods I described for. Uh, systematically developing AI algorithms and models. And I hope you can see digital, digital technology as a tool for greater good. You know, I think future progress will come from cross-disciplinary teams combining experts in digital technology, AI, machine learning with uh, people who are sophisticated about the application domains, be it healthcare, climate change, uh, other things that we'd like to do, the, uh, managing the economy, things that we'd like to use our digital tools to do more effectively. So I hope this was helpful to you as a just high level framing and, and put, making a few points that I thought from a, as a point of view of a technologist are sometimes misunderstood. And I, I hope that that helps you in, in thinking about the future of work, addressing the needs to build a uh, successful workforce and you know, thinking a little bit about you know, what kind of society do we want and, and how do we shape the future of, of work and education to, to produce a, a world that we really really want to live in. So thank you for the time to talk with you. I, I, I really hope, wish you all the best in your conversations and, and the you know, difficult problems you're, you're dealing with. And, and you know, thank you for, for, the, for the chance to participate.